Hey, it's Rod Yates here. Now, normally this is where I say welcome to another episode of Humans of Music, a Jackster podcast. But this is not just another episode. This is episode number 100. We made it. <laughs> if this is the first episode you've listened to, then welcome and thank you. If it's the 100th episode, then a big, big thank you to you. Now, a landmark episode requires a very special guest. And in that regard, we have a bona fide musical legend in Don Woz. Don was a founding member of Was Not Was. He's a Grammy-winning producer with an incredible CV that includes artists like Bob Dylan, Elton John, The Rolling Stones, Bonnie Raitt, Willie Nelson, and many, many more. He's currently playing bass with Grateful Dead co-founder Bob Weir in Bobby Weir and Wolf Brothers. And he's also the president of one of the world's most famous record labels, Blue Note Records. So without further ado, here is the one, the only, Don Was. I thought a great place to start is, of course, Blue Note and your work ah, as the label president there. Yes. With this being, I believe this is 10 years, your 10-year anniversary this year. This is, it, almost to the day, I think, actually, yeah. At, at what point did you feel comfortable in that role? Mm, about, about a year ago. <laughs> 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 no, you, you want to know the honest to God's truth? It's, it's about yeah. a five-year learning curve. We got a lot of stuff done while we're learning, you know, but... Uh, it takes a while. I, I never forget about being president of a record company. I never had a job. <laughs> okay. And it was by design. You know, that that was my goal in life was to never have to go to work at something that I didn't feel like doing, you know. Yeah. And I made it to fifty eight and I <laughs> and I thought I was home home free, you know. And uh it was just, a, it was an irresistible offer. It was a real quirky thing. I was in New York producing John Mayer's record, Born and Raised. And we took one night off. And I had heard Gregory Porter on the radio uh, in right. L.A. driving around. So I'm in New York City. And the night off, I checked the Village Voice. And I see that he's appearing at this club, Smoke. And I'd never seen him live, really. So I went up there and I sat through all three sets. And it was really one of the best shows I ever went to. I, I just loved every minute of it. I, I wasn't there for professional reasons. I was there as a fan. Yeah. And uh, it was beautiful. So the next morning, I was having breakfast with a buddy of mine, a guy named Dan McCarroll, who I, I met when he was the drummer for Lewis Cole. No, not Lewis right. Cole. No, uh, Lloyd Cole, sorry. <laughs> Lloyd Cole, <laughs> Lloyd Cole. right. Yeah. Yeah, Lloyd Cole and the commotions, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and his uh, soon-to-be wife was uh, my assistant all through the 90s. And he'd ascended through the ranks and had become president of Capitol Records. So we were having breakfast in New York, and uh, I just said, uh, we weren't even talking about music, really. We're, we're, we're talking about we were talking about staying sober under pressure is what we were talking about. Right. And then right, okay. at the, right at the end, I just asked him if Blue Note was still part of Capitol Records. Because if it was, he really should go hear this guy, Gregory Porter, and sign him. And he just blurted out, no, you should sign him. And he offered me the gig <laughs> like that. Well, man, I was torn because I've been a fan of Blue Note since I bought the first record. My, the first record in my collection was in 1966, Mode for Joe, right. by Joe Henderson. And I thought it was, uh, it was more than just a, a label that distributed music. It represented a, like a lifestyle, like a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So it meant a lot to me, always. I wouldn't have even considered a, a gig with another record company, but I couldn't resist the offer i was like oh yeah. no man <laughs> now i'm gonna take a job <laughs> so i was like reticent but thrilled at the same time i took the gig and like yeah almost 10 years to the day i showed up there and i didn't know anything i i really had no idea how to do the, i dealt with record companies for 30 some years you know but i yeah. didn't know how to do the job and they were all based in uh new york at the time it, Capitol Records was still part of EMI. And uh, I showed up at the office in LA. They gave me a parking space, literally. They gave me like a cup full of pencils, <laughs> a computer, a phone, and a stereo system in an office. And it was like, start. <laughs> I was playing with the pencils. It was fantastic. I, I didn't have a clue. 
and it it takes time to to figure it out. And and that also the, the guy I was succeeding was a, a guy named uh, Bruce Lundvall, who mm. was one of the most beloved figures in the record business of all time, a real artist man. You know, he cared about yeah. artists and and he was loved by the artists. And he also was a guy who would answer your emails in 30 seconds and always right. return calls right away. And I had to follow that. And I couldn't, I couldn't be that. So, so f- the hard part is really, there's no real mystery to any of this stuff, but it's, it's figuring out the way to do it as yourself. Yeah. Otherwise, you're doing karaoke. You're doing the business equivalent of playing karaoke music, and it only will take you so far. So I, I'd say yeah. it, was a, it was a five-year learning curve. What was the key to that, though, doing it the way that was true to yourself? Just accepting my weaknesses. You know? <laughs> I don't, right. I'm, not, I don't, I'm not good at reading. I mean, I can do it, but I don't enjoy reading profit and loss uh, estimates and projections and all that stuff. But I don't have to. Yeah, I, I just have, I've got someone who works at the company who's really into doing <laughs> that stuff, who's really into doing contracts and gets off on making deals. So you, you just learn to delegate the things that you're not so good at. It's, it applies to yeah. everything in life. It's not just running a record company. You know, Play to your strengths. The, the, the things that make you different from everyone else, those are your strengths. You know? so, right. so, so play to those and don't try to be something you're not. Yeah. And for you, your strengths are in this regard in terms of running a label? I love music. <laughs> <laughs> I love music and I know how to make records. And I, and I think most importantly, because I, I'm still out playing gigs uh, and, still, mm. and I still record and I still go through that process, especially playing with Bobby Weir every night where you're improvising right. and you're reaching out into the creative ether and just hoping to pull down something good. Uh, you have to understand how that works, I think. You, not necessarily to run the record company, but someone at the company better understand what artists go through. Should be an artist right. themselves. And I think that's a, that's a real asset. There, there aren't too many companies where that's happening. I'm not, mm. I'm not saying a lawyer can't run a record company. The lawyers have done great jobs running a record company. But you got to have somebody there. And preferably, the higher up, the better, who understands, <laughs> you know? Like, it, well, uh, let me give you a really concrete example. Like, sometimes musicians are late. We have a deadline, you know? We have to, right now, vinyl is so important, right? And you, right. have, you have to book time at a pressing plant six months in, in advance. And if you miss your day, it's not like, all right, well, don't worry, we'll get it tomorrow. It's like you go to the back of the line because there's someone else there tomorrow. And you, right. and you have to wait months again. So there's a lot of pressure for artists to deliver. But I know what it's like to finish a record. I understand the indecision <laughs> due to <laughs> not knowing what you've got and, and also a desire to even make it better. Mm. And that's got to be respected. You know, you can't just say your deadline is to, you know, no musician right. he knows how to deal with that. that. That's being an enemy of music. The correct thing is within reason, it's ready when, it's, when you think it's great. And you have to yeah. work with musicians you trust and accept their definition of great. Is that something that you'd been afforded? in terms of your artistic career and in dealing with record labels? Because I'd seen you talk about the fact that um, for a while in your career, you actually even saw record labels as the enemy. Mm -hmm. So you're now coming into this this position as the label president. Did it open your eyes to some of the decisions that had been made in the past in regards to your career? Could you see a logic behind them then? I understand the logic behind it, but I don't necessarily agree with it. Uh, In fact, I, I disagree with a lot of it, you know? Um, <laughs> the, the, the grossest infringement of the artist uh, record company relationship comes when people sign an artist because there's something they love about them and they believe that they're going to do well and, and that other people are going to respond to that music and then they try to change them to fit whatever's popular in that particular moment I see right. it happen time and time and time again so they love you, and then they sign you, and then they try to change you. 
And right. You can get really confused. I got really confused. I, we had a band called Was Not Was back in the yes. late 80s, early 90s. And unfortunately, we had a really big hit with a song that wasn't really typical of what we were doing. It was a song called yeah. Walk the Dinosaur, which had a kind of novelty thing to it. And it had an R&B groove, so in that sense, it, it, it naturally came out of Detroit. But we didn't know how to do it again. So when they said, we need another one like Walk the Dinosaur, I was like, well, man, we, I don't know how we did the first one. I, I'll do something else for you, but I don't, I, don't, yeah. I don't think we can go back and do that again. Well, then they, they start pressuring you, finally. Uh, yeah, man, and these are, they're all well-intentioned people. I, I like their A&R people. And they, they, I'm going to complain about them, but they also spent a lot of money on us and believed in us when we were a big risk. They, they took a gigantic risk on us, and I'm, mm. I'm grateful for life for that opportunity. But uh, I remember the guy saying, look, I think we could have a hit if you guys would cover In Excess's Listen Like Thieves. Right. As like, but like as an electronic kind of thing. Well, first of all, we're like a soul review, right? So we played live. So doing a, an electronic kind of thing, that meant hiring somebody who wasn't in the band to do a track and try to... And I remember hand, handing it in and saying, uh, I don't know, is this what you want? We'd completely lost our direction, our confidence, our vision, you know? We didn't know anymore. We were just stabbing in the dark to make the record company happy. And we, it, it was well-crafted, but it wasn't a hit, and it didn't, had nothing to do with was and I was. It had mm. nothing to do with anything, because it came from an, an... It's a good song, too. Proven hit. You know, got proof of concept yeah. behind it. Can't blame the song, you know? It's, <laughs> but it, it, it just didn't ring true. And uh, I learned from that. As a producer, I've always defended the artists you know like let's what is the thing that you're trying to do let's do that if we have to lock the door and keep the a and r people out we'll do it you know but let's let's be beholden to your vision not what the data says is popular now which actually means it was popular six months ago because in order to collect the data and then compile it and then analyze it you're already months behind the curve now you're reacting to old data and anyway I could go on all day about it, but that's you just, no, so, it's, it, it's so simple, man. You sign musicians, you believe in and trust and let them be themselves. That's all you got to yeah. do. And all the records that we love from years ago, the albums that endure decade after decade after decade and remain relevant, even when the world completely changes, those are records that were made by some gonzo record company executives like Ahmed Erdogan or like uh, Chris Blackwell or mm -hmm. you know, just renegade into, or like Alfred Lyon and Francis Wolfe who started Blue Note. They did yes. what they wanted to and they trusted the artists and that's enduring music. And the stuff that's fashionable, manufactured hit is successful for a minute and not so relevant anymore in a year, let alone, you know, 80 years later. Absolutely. So it's just a basic lesson. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How did you, um, that, I mean, that was a great, you learned a lot as a producer, but as an artist, how did that affect the way that you approached Was Not Was after that moment and, and artistry moving forward? Well, we didn't, man. You know, it killed our band. And we're not alone in that. You know, you get, you get confused, you lose your confidence, your visions become diluted. And uh, by the way, I, I don't blame the record company for that. We're the one who grasped for the brass. You know, they said, if you'll just do this, you could have this. And yeah, we want that. You know, who doesn't yeah. want that, right? So we did it to ourselves. <laughs> we could have said no. You know, it's like we, we could have said, no, we're not going to do that. Here's what we do. And if you don't like it, We'll go somewhere else or we'll go nowhere else, but we're not yeah. going to do that. that that's the artist's responsibility. Yeah. So it, it killed us. It killed my band. You know? And that's an interesting lesson to learn because I guess around about that time is when your production career was starting to get into to full yeah. swing. I think that, that sort of lines up. So you've had your confidence knocked as an artist, but you're now going into production sessions where you're having to be the confident voice and the voice of that's good, that's yeah. not good, try this, try that. Yeah. Was that a hard balance to walk? 
Mm, no, well, not really, because it's actually easier to stand up for someone else than it is for yourself. You know, it, it, it's easy for uh, your confidence to be shaken. But it, it, it was, you know, they, they couldn't. There's nobody who could shake my confidence in like Bonnie Raitt. I trusted her. Right. I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd stake my kids' lives on her intuition. <laughs> uh, she, she is, she's one of the great artists of all time. I had no pro- because that happened to her when we handed in nick of time. There was someone at the record company who said, "You know, if you just do a cover of a Motown song, we'd have a hit single." I don't hear any singles on there. Wow! And if we'd have done that, it wouldn't have been the record it was. It was because there, yeah. were, there were no hit singles, but there, were, there was a statement being made by a very powerful performer, you know, artist, who, who showed a whole lot of courage, man. She was, she was writing songs as a female rock and roll artist, really, about turning 40. And mm. up until then, I can't think of anyone who did that. You know, it was all, if you were 40, you pretended to be 18, because it, it had to be young and sexy. And, and she was talking about running out of time to have children and seeing her parents get old. And that's, she was dealing with heavy issues. And it, it went against the formula. It went against mm. tr- what was trending on the radio. But no one did any research to see, well, what, what's that audience going through? They're the same age as her now. That whole 60s rock and roll audience, is, they're all turning 40 now. And mm. and she talked about something real, and you know, won the Grammy for album of the year. We sold about eight million records or something like that, and it paid no respect to any formulas or fashion or trend. It went, it bucked every trend, except it was totally in sync with the zeitgeist of the time for her audience. Yeah, did you sense that when you were recording it, when you were making it? Oh, I knew it. It was real, and it rang true. And when we were proud of it, but I didn't think it was going to resonate like it did. Right. I, in fact, I remember a guy from the record company came down and said, "You got a tuxedo?" We we played him back a song. He said, "You got a tuxedo?" I said, "What do you mean? I got it? No, I don't have a tuxedo. What do you mean?" <laughs> and he said, "Because you're going to the Grammys." And I, I wanted to punch him in the mouth, man. I thought, you know, you you can say you like it without being all hyperbolic like that. <laughs> but we went to the Grammys. He was right. <laughs> you mentioned earlier the uh, mode for joe by joe henderson yeah, was the yeah. first blue note album that, that you heard and i understand that the first time you heard it you were actually in a car you were running some errands with your mum, and it came on the radio that's exactly when right. you when you started a blue note did you have the opportunity to recall the masters and, <laughs> and listen to it in its purest form it was one of the first things i did because we were coming up on a 75th anniversary and so we had to remaster some albums, and we were going to put them out on, on vinyl, right? So, of course, it was the first one I requisitioned. And I went to the mastering room, and I put it up, and I got all excited. And, you know, it sounded different than the way I remembered it because I wasn't listening to vinyl anymore. It, it felt more homemade, you know? It was a little more intimate and... Uh, I missed some aspects of what happened in the mastering. So I called up the legendary Rudy Van Gelder, who was the recording engineer who cut all of the classic Blue Note recordings in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. And he not only cut it and mixed it live, but he mastered all of it in the studio too. And I just said, man, I'm putting up the tapes and it doesn't sound like the records. So what's the truth here? I said, I don't want to do what other people do and editorialize. I don't want to improve, in quotes, improve what you did because yeah. I said, whatever you did, it worked. It blew my mind when I was 14. So I, so I don't want to change that. Well, but what's the truth? And Rudy said, well, that's a good question. He said, if you could listen to the lacquers we cut on the lathe, that was the truth. Those sounded really good because he tried playing them back. Uh, yeah. But but you can only play them back a couple of times, and then they flatten out. And, and once you go through the manufacturing process, they're gone. So they don't exist. So he said the next best thing, you should probably listen to the first pressings. And uh, so we tried doing that, and we tried matching it up 
and be honest with you, we were we were doing what I just said you shouldn't do, which is we were abandoning intuition and feeling and just being like human oscilloscopes and trying to match mm. the wave patterns. And <laughs> and that that round of vinyl reissue was not particularly well received by the audiophile community who can be quite vocal and very mean. Well, let's, let's just say they can be uh, demonstrative in their okay. <laughs> in their comments on Facebook. And I thought, well, man, what are we doing wrong? And then I listened to these audiophile versions that were being done by uh, a guy named Joe Harley. It had a company called Music Matters, and they would license our masters, and they would supervise everything through the pressing and making the jackets. And I put their versions up, and I didn't know how they achieved that. It was a great result. So long story short, we approached Joe and said, why don't you do it for us? Because we're really screwing it up. Right? And he said, sure. And we started something called the Tone Poets Series, which has been yeah. incredibly well received. And the first time I went to a mastering session with Joe and the, the mastering engineer, Kevin Gray, I realized that they'd been doing Blue Note for so long that they didn't refer to anything. They had internalized Rudy Van Gelder's ethos, right? Right, <laughs> And they yeah. just did it because they understood him so well. And they operated from instinct, and it was more feel and less science, I think. And okay. it, it was brilliant. And then, of course, there are like a dozen other steps in the manufacturing process. Making, making vinyl records is alchemy. It's a crazy, <laughs> detailed process that if you get the privilege to go see a record pressing plant and especially the, the plating part where they take the slacker and they make stampers out of it. It's magic, man. It's, yeah. it's, it's alchemy. It's crazy. You, you dip this stuff in a nickel bath and it, <laughs> and it forms on the plate into like a, a perfectly molded stamper that, uh, that stays true to the fidelity of the, of the initial recording. It's so cool, but so complex. And every step of the way matters. Even the, the choice of presses you use. I, I never knew that individual record presses had characteristics. I mean, why wouldn't they? With like a, right. every, every Fender Strat sounds different. Just because it's a Fender Strat, that doesn't mean it, it's going to be uniform. They're all, it's two pieces of wood put together. Of course, each one's yeah. going to sound different. So same with presses. You know, they all have a little bit of a quality. And Joe figured out which single press was the most conducive to the fidelity of Blue Note recordings. And right. he only pressed on that press at a place called RTI in uh, in Ojai, just north of Los yeah. Angeles. Okay. And so uh, I've gone really far and wide in this discussion. <laughs> I, I don't. I can't remember That's what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> the, the question was whether whether you had um, pulled up the Masters of Mode for Joe oh, yeah, your, yeah. when you started at Blue Note and how emotional that was for you. It was really something. It was, it was something because, you know, a lot of those things were cut in the living room of Rudy's parents' house un until the early 60s when he built his own studio. And you can tell, you know, you listen to that Thelonious Monk record or, or even Blue Train was cut in the living room of Rudy's parents' house in New Jersey, right? Wow. And you can hear it. It's intimate and very personal and very, it's, it's kind of sweet. It's a little smaller. Mm. And then just a couple things that he did, not to change the sound, but so the needle wouldn't skip. And those things gave it a little extra power, a little bit of compression, a little bit of EQ, just okay. a little bit. But it, it translated to a, a mightier sound. So, yeah. Yeah. In terms of, um, I guess, you discovering music, where you're growing up in Detroit, yeah. in um, Oak Park, I believe. Very good. What, what kind of area? What kind of area was Oak Park when you were growing up? It was suburbs, man. You know, it was like it was post war. That post World War Two, it all built after that. You know, so the trees were like little twigs. I go back there now, and that's that's what I noticed. It's like all the trees got so big over the last fifty years. You know. Yeah. Uh, but it was. New suburbs is everything you think about America in the 1950s, you know, terrified of nuclear war. We had A-bomb air raid drills where we'd hide under our desks like that was going to save us. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, we were terrified of the Russians coming over any minute and, you know, nuking all of us and taking away our freedom of press and all that. <laughs> you know, and there was a future promise to us in the 50s. You know, there's a great song of Donald Fagan's called IGY, right? which is what a, beautiful, what a beautiful world it will be. And, we, you know, we thought robots were going to serve us toast for breakfast every day and we'd be <laughs> flying around in little jet cars, you know, by 2000. And definitely that would be yeah. happening. Right? And there'd be world peace and no hunger and no greed. And, well, it didn't, didn't, didn't work out. It <laughs> didn't quite turn out that way. But, uh, but it, was an, it was a great time to grow up because we kind of believed in it. You know, I grew up in the mm -hmm. middle of the civil rights movement and we really, everyone felt that that was going to change, you know. Was, things were going to change in the 1960s. There were isolated moments of triumph, you know, when people who were anti-Vietnam War, they didn't want the U.S. fighting that war, uh, didn't think it was the right thing to do. They basically got the, Lyndon Johnson to retire. They got the president to step down. And there was a feeling like that people would rise up and change things. For the better, mm. and uh, it makes me really sad. To I, I kind of can't watch the news. I, I know you're supposed to watch it and be aware and be an activist, but it kind of breaks my heart to see how the thing has moved so much in the opposite direction. And just mm. you know, I mean, it's just fallen so far short of this peaceful, loving existence that I thought was going to happen. And mm. and people are just. The, like decency has disappeared, you know, just between people. I'm not talking about morals or like swearing on records. <laughs> I'm just talking about people being nice to each other and caring about each other and not being so greedy. It's, re it's really sad what's happened. We'll be back with more from Don after this short break. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with Don Woz. Growing up around that civil rights movement, the music of the time was was clearly pretty extraordinary. Was, was that where was that the music that you were, um, I guess, indoctrinated into? Was that the music that first grabbed you? Well, you know, I'm uh, I'm a little bit older, so it wasn't the first music, but uh, okay. you know, I mean, I was aware of Elvis, and I was 12 years old when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan, and I, yeah. I, I so I wish I could tell you that I was drawn to music. To, to change the world, to as a you know, to fight the good fight. But in fact, I was drawn to music because all the girls were screaming for the Beatles, you know. And <laughs> I thought, wait a minute, they're, they're having fun, they're making money, and girls love them. Let's do that. <laughs> take, take the path of least resistance. Uh, but but as I got older, <laughs> uh, you know, I had some radical professors who said that art and politics are inseparable. So that was really mm. the, the thought of, in the late 60s. And so I believe that. And you could see how uh, social movements needed anthems and, and the, uh, the effect, the motivational effect of great, inspiring music was on, on people. So, yeah, yeah no, I, I, I became acutely aware of that. It never felt like a, uh, what's the word for it? Like just a lazy pursuit you know, it, it always seemed like a, a noble way to, to spend your life, that you could improve the world and improve people's lives, definitely. If, if improving the world seemed a little grandiose and a little too abstract, you could tell just when you played in front of people and had an effect on them with a song. You could see that, that you were bringing some comfort to people, that you were helping them understand their own lives. Man, life is insane man you know but we we walk around every day not knowing if we're going to die in the next 10 seconds or if our loved ones are going to die in the next 10 seconds everybody ends up getting divorced or you know getting fired there's, there's very little to hang your hat on mm -hmm. and it's it's no wonder that we're meant to be these like kind of tribal creatures that live in clans and caves <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now yeah. we're all isolated in these cars, and uh, it's no shock that there are more shrinks than farmers in this country, you know? Um, <laughs> right. it, it, things have gotten so far out of balance, and music really, it's certainly helped me 
in times mm. when I've been lost. Uh, it's helped me remember who I am and what it was I set out to do, and it's given me the, the strength to carry on. Yeah. So I, I think that that's a really good thing, and I'm acutely aware of that. With every record we release on the label, with every show I play with Bob Weir, I know what these what those Grateful Dead songs mean to that audience. I can see it on their faces. You know, when we do Ripple every fourth or fifth night, we know 125 songs at this point. Mm. So we can go about, we can play four three-hour shows without repeating anything. But every, yeah, every fourth or fifth night ripples the encore. And when we go into that, I just see everybody in the audience. They're, they're hugging each other. They're, they're crying. They're closing their eyes and singing along. There hasn't been, a, we've been doing it since 2018, or he's been doing it forever, but I, I've been playing bass with him since 2018. There hasn't been a time we played Ripple that I, I didn't get choked up looking at the audience. And you know that you're, you're bringing comfort and strength to people. Yeah. That's a good thing. So powerful. Yeah. But there's one more, one more thing I wanted to ask you just about that upbringing in Detroit, yeah. and that is that the Stooges, or I think mm. they were called the Psychedelic Stooges at Very that good. time. They this played, is true. At your, played at your high school. They, yeah, they played at actually the, it was the neighboring high school, but I went. Okay. Yeah, but I saw them when I, I, they, I saw them play in the neighboring high school, and I saw them play a lot. I saw, there was a show called the uh, they did it at the State Fairgrounds called the Detroit Rock and Roll Revival, and they went on between Sun Ra and Chuck Berry. Wow. Those were the days. <laughs> and they were awesome then, man. I, I liked them a lot. When they got back together in 2003, they had Mike Watt playing bass. I loved yeah. the way they played those songs. I thought they, they sounded yeah. really good. But they, they were an incredible band. And I think Iggy's one of the most formidable front men, if not the most formidable ever in mm. I, mean, he, I put him right up there, certainly with James Brown and Mick Jagger and uh, anyone else that you just can't take your eyes off of. And he, and he had an intensity in his eyes, still does, man, if you go see him, right. that nobody was that intense. <laughs> I've, yeah. played, you know, yeah. I play, I've played live with him. We did a show. We, we played a thing. It was actually Wayne Kramer from the MC5 put it together. And it was Wayne and myself and Tom Morello. And it was a crazy show. It was to raise money for a drug uh, rehab place for mm. young kids and a music program. And then we repeated it at Sing Sing Prison the next day. We played for prisoners. Wow. And I mean, it's Perry Farrell, Gilby Clark, Tom Morello. Uh, I'm forgetting people. Wayne uh, is Tom's band with Boots Riley. You know, it, was, it was really cool. And Iggy came out on stage, and he had this look in his eyes. First of all, he transforms his whole skeleton, like kind of changes, like the second before he goes out. And he turns into a fourteen-year-old kid, and and gets this look. And he came out, and the you know the band had music stands and stuff. He kicked them all over, and, and he kicked a guy in the front row, and he scared me. <laughs> I, it was just it was just like being across the street from a tornado. <laughs> wow. Kind of hoping it, it changes direct. Don't come in my direction and <laughs> start kicking me in the chest. Uh, but it, 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 he burned so brightly and so intent, and it was so intense, man, that uh, my first reaction was fear. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's that's power, man. He's an incredible performer. And you and you'd had a big history with him by that point as well, producing Brick by Brick and and uh, Avenue B. Avenue B, yeah, yeah. At that point, yeah. I, I never thought I didn't meet him until uh, like maybe 1989. Okay. Uh, but I'd seen him play a whole bunch in Detroit, you know. And yeah, uh, I mean, I love him. I think he's such an interesting guy because. He did so many things that were raw, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, like every story you heard about him's got some element of truth in there, you know. But then I, <laughs> when I met him for the first time, he, we talked about Haitian art for a long time, and he's incredibly well-read, super intelligent, erudite man, you know. Mm -hmm. But he's also the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I think his songwriting <laughs> reflects that, you know. His writing is incredibly insightful. I recently went back and read some of the lyrics that were on uh, Brick by Brick, 
This song, Starry, Starry Night, was the one that really grabbed me. And they, they were just prescient, man. He foresaw what was coming in a way that no one else did. And mm. uh, the songs are more re relevant today than they were in 89. And he's a smart, intense artist. Yeah. And yeah. a lovely guy, too. Really nice guy. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah. One, one of the um, key friendships in your upbringing was um, David Weiss, who, yeah. of course, would become your partner in, yeah. in Was Not Was. And I understand that his parents were voiceover actors, and you would actually go to the studio and, and watch them yeah. record. How yeah. pivotal was that for you in terms of introducing you to that life? It was essential. You know, I, I, I don't think I would have been doing this if, if I hadn't been afforded that opportunity. They would go down and record commercials, uh, you know, voiceover work at, at a place called United Sound in Detroit, which is also, it's like where John Lee Hooker cut Boogie Chill and incredible. It's still standing, by the way. And yeah. George Clinton had it locked out in the, you know, in the, certainly through the 80s and uh, a little bit in the 70s. Don Davis, who was a great producer, cut all his records there. Uh, you know, Aretha cut there. It was, it was just a great studio. And I just liked being around. And we'd want, David and I, we'd wander around, and you'd just see all these rooms with these beautiful microphones and all these cables. And I just wanted to be in there. I tried to buy it a couple of years ago. <laughs> it was for sale. And I thought, man, let's just get this place. This is this is the dream. And I yeah. went I hadn't been in there in like 25, 30 years and I went in and walked around and it the it was all intact, but the problem was that it was 150 feet too close to the expansion of a freeway. Right. And the, the state of Michigan wanted to move it over 150 feet, which I don't think <laughs> is a good idea. <laughs> you know, studios are all about walls. You know, it's it's yeah. it's the a great studio is a room that for some reason sometimes it's by design, but a lot of times it's just by kismet. You know that the reflections off the walls are harmonic as opposed to dissonant, and those are the rooms that sound sweet. And there aren't that many that really, really work, and that's one of them. And I do believe that there's uh, kind of a psychic patina in these rooms mm. where all, all these great records have been made. That's I like working in old rooms because yeah. I'm acutely aware of what happened before, and I feel it, it's still hovering around you and inspiring you. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you just briefly about some of your production work, um, which which um, you obviously moved into heavily in the late 80s and, and up to this day. One, one of my favorite albums that I think just doesn't get the due that it's owed is Paul Westerberg's, ah. um, and I don't know if I, I've never known if I pr pronounced this correctly, Suicane Gratification. I, I think that's <laughs> right, yeah. That sounds okay. right. <laughs> I don't know. Is it gratification or gratification? I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you have the I'm cover there? Sure. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't think I've ever said the name aloud. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. that word. Yeah, Sulacane <laughs> something. Yeah. But what uh, was that? What was that like recording that? Because it's it's a quiet album for Paul. Yeah, there are some yeah. some rockier parts in places, yeah. but there are some beautiful, beautiful, intimate, quiet moments on there. What was it like recording that for you? Well, I love him, man. He's a he's a good guy, man. We got on great. I was really inspired, less by the replacements. I didn't know their stuff that well. I would kind of missed that. I was doing something else, and I missed them in, when they were first out. But I loved his solo records, that 14 songs. Yeah. I just thought that's one of the best records I've ever heard. In fact, when I first started working with the Stones, when we cut Voodoo Lounge, I used to listen to that in the hotel in the morning before we went to the studio every single day. We we're, uh, were in Dublin at the Shelbourne Hotel. And I thought, that's, you know, that's what a modern Stones record should sound like. Not a bunch of synthesizers, but it was recorded. It felt very live, but it took advantage of the modern recording technology. It wasn't retro, but it was retro in the sense that it was real, that people were really playing as a band. And I, I loved that record. So this is the way things happen if you live in L.A. I, I was on the playground dropping my kids off at school, and uh, <laughs> another dad, there was a guy named Gary Gersh, who was also, he was the president of Capitol Records at the time. 
And so we were just talking. He said, do you like Paul Westerberg? I said, oh, man, I love Paul Westerberg. He said, great. You, you should produce this next record. And uh, so, <laughs> so we did it. And I, I just loved working with him, man. I loved playing bass with him. And uh, I thought his songwriting was uh, excellent. I think he's a great and really highly underrated guitar player and a really expressive singer. And it, mm. it, it, I, I remember it as a really good period in my life. And uh, I'm grateful for the chance to work with him. I like him a lot. Nice. When you think about your work with Paul and you know, Bob Dylan and the Rolling Stones, Elton John, Roy Orbison, have, 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 did you allow yourself moments while working with these artists to just sit back and be a fan? Oh, you, yeah. And just, just think, oh, I, I can't believe I'm watching this right now. Are there moments that spring to mind? Okay. I, I still feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know that it's always a couple times a day. You know there were there were periods when we did the overdubs to Voodoo Lounge. We did them at my house in L.A. up on Mulholland, and I had the Rolling Stones at my over at the house for like a month and a half or something every day. You know, I, by the time I came down to the it was a, the bought the house next door, made it a studio, man. And Keith would be sitting around the pool by the time I got there. <laughs> <laughs> and and every so often, you know, like three or four times a day, like my blood pressure would just go way up. And I, I'd say, oh, my God, look who's here. And just to see those iconic guys together and also uh, their energy, man. They, if you, <laughs> you know, if, if you m make a living out of playing in stadiums, that means you can project to the back of a stadium you have do, do you remember when uh, before voodoo lounge tour they they did the steel wheels tour and they had these big yeah. blow up dolls that were like five stories high that's right. that's them man their their personalities <laughs> transcend the skin so much that that's really their personalities are five stories high but contained in these human bodies and that's why they can play they could they could play the stadiums without the tv screens and you'd still feel like they were playing just for you if you were sitting all the way in the back so yeah. imagine that energy in a room <laughs> <laughs> wow so yeah no but I, I think that all the time and i'm grateful all the time to just to be allowed in these studios it it, it feels honestly like yesterday that the door was closed and i just wanted to be making records so badly and mm. you know i think everyone you know who every musician feels like oh this this is gonna be my last one they're gonna figure out the truth <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> and they're gonna kick me out of here <laughs> so uh yeah no I, I'm, I'm you're constantly appreciative i think of it that energy that you were talking about that the stones have how do you wrangle that how, how, how do you, particularly the first time you're working with them and you're, yeah. you're trying to get to know them and, yeah. and understand their personalities, what techniques do you have to, to try and wrangle that? I don't think you want to wrangle it. I think you want to encourage it. <laughs> 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 I, I, I want them to be as rolling stones as possible, you know? So right. uh, I think you're doomed. You try to wrangle it, man. You know, how, you, know you, you just try to... All I ever tried to do as a producer was work with great people, find out mm. what they were going after, and help them get there. There, there's, there are a number of ways to produce records. There's no right or wrong way, and everyone's got their own way of doing it, and everyone's got their own strength. There's some people, like I used to, you know, Babyface was a good, I guess we're still good buddies. I just haven't seen him in a while, but I used to watch mm. him work, and he was a producer, but he wrote the songs, played the tracks, made the tracks, he laid down a vocal, and then if he was producing you, you'd come in and match to his vocal, and you'd have a hit. And that's a perfectly legitimate way of making a record. That's a, he's an mm. auteur producer. Uh, Daniel Lanois is an auteur producer. Weaves this tapestry that's his, you know, around an artist. And I love that. That's just not my strength. Yeah. My strength is, and the thing that I enjoy, to be honest with you, is getting inside the heads of brilliant people, figuring out what they're trying to do, and helping them take practical steps to achieve that. 
the the highest praise any artist can give me is at the end of the record if they say, "Oh man, that's that's exactly what I was hearing in my head when we f- had our first meeting." But it it came out even better. Yeah, that's better than s- selling five million albums to me. That means we succeeded. Yeah. You know, whatever happens after that is gravy. <laughs> you know, you know, you know what I'm saying. Any anything that happens yeah. after that, just that's all bonus stuff. The the idea yeah. is to to help them achieve what they wanted to achieve. That's yeah. I get the most satisfaction from that, and I think you know that that plays more to my strength than me building something and trying to squeeze an artist into it. Yeah. When do you think you realized that and got good at it? Because you, you've spoken in the past about working with Bob Dylan on the Under the Red Sky album, yeah. and and how perhaps you didn't do that on that record. No, I definitely was, didn't. Was that, do that a learning process? <laughs> it's a learning process. But I learned a lot from that Bob Dylan record. I, all my life, that's all I wanted to do was play bass with Bob Dylan. You know, if he called today and offered me the gig, I'd say, yeah, sure, man. What do I have to quit Blue Note? Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll be right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was the gig I wanted, and I. Yeah. And I, when I started producing records, he was always the dream artist. Now, the first day we were in the studio, the assistant engineer ran a DAT tape. That'll date it for you. <laughs> Maybe it was a cassette even. But they, they ran everything. Off, so you heard all the dialogue in between, which you shouldn't do. <laughs> but he gave it to me after the session. And I remember driving home, and I got to a part where Bob was at the piano playing something and telling me what he wanted to do. And I was telling him why it wouldn't work before we tried it even. Right. And I thought, wait a minute, you waited all your life to be in a studio with Bob Dylan and you didn't even let him be Bob Dylan. And I was nauseous, man. I was like sick to my stomach. I had to pull over. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, I'll never do that again. <laughs> um, and I really have tried now. You know, if, you know, Paul Westerberg was a guy who liked to try things out and go on detours. And if we took a, a four day detour in pursuit of something that he was hearing and it didn't work, I was okay with that. Mm. But that was what I learned could, because I heard myself not letting Bob Dylan do it because I came in with my agenda of what I thought a Bob Dylan record should sound like. And it wasn't even a good agenda. It was like if I had a great idea, like Daniel Lamont, who did Oh Mercy, had a great idea. And he made a record yeah. that sounded like nothing that Bob Dylan had ever done before, but fit perfectly. Mm. And I just, want, you know, I was an idiot. I just wanted him to remake Blonde on Blonde. So I was angling for that. Let's, let's sound like the old Bob Dylan, instead of mm. realizing that he was doing something miles ahead. He was trying to move forward. Yeah. And, and I realized that too late on that. But I, I've done stuff with him subsequently where I, sure. we've made up for it. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I feel nice. okay. I don't think he's bearing a grudge. <laughs> <laughs> when you do work with these artists, who are obviously incredible artists, does it make you question your artistry as well and and the the songs that you write are you do you have to stop yourself comparing them to to dylan to roy orbison to bonnie Wright? well i went through about a 10-year period where i couldn't write a song because for that very reason because i was watching bob and willie nelson and chris christopherson and you know the stones you know watching them work and watching them actually write songs and i i've you know, I, I remember asking Bob Dylan once, in fact, I said, how come you can write Gates of Eden and I can't? And he was very nice about it. He said, well, if it makes you feel any better, I, I didn't write it. I, he said, I was holding the pencil and it came through my fingers, but I, did, I, right. don't, I don't know where it came from. So I thought, <laughs> oh, all right. And then that, that, that seemed to be a motif that, that would recur with the greatest people I've worked with. You know, like in the studio, Keith Richards, he doesn't say, oh, wait, I got an idea. He'll say, hold it, hold it, incoming, incoming. And he knows, the great people know it's coming from beyond. And it passes through. Uh, uh, Lamont Dozier, who from Holland Dozier, Holland passed away uh, a couple of weeks ago. And in one of his obituaries, I, I read a quote where he said, uh, I, I thank God for letting me uh, put my name on his songs. 
right. and, and that's just another way of saying it, you know, that uh, they come from someplace else and, and you're a vehicle for it. So it, it's always, I, the way, here's how I looked at it. Like, I always thought of there being this creative ether way up in the sky, right? And artists reach up there and grab stuff out of there. But the best stuff's at the top, and only a few people have tentacles long enough to reach through all the dross and pull <laughs> pu and pull down the gates of Eden. And, right? yep. <laughs> and I know I don't have that, uh, and it's it, it's disconcerting to me. It breaks my heart. I wish I could do it, but I can't go as deep. However, what I finally the thing that finally snapped me out of a writing malaise was that I thought, all right, you're never going to write a song as good as Willie Nelson. He's way better than you. But he didn't grow up in Detroit in the 1960s going to see the MC5 and f having, you know, f the Parliament's played at my junior high school. They played a sock hop yeah. there. You know, so yeah. it's like he doesn't know that stuff. So if you just can be yourself and convey that in your music, that's okay. You don't have to be Willie Nelson. You don't have to be as great as him to do something valid. And mm. uh, I could live with that. And I also got, a, you know, like an incredible master class watching everybody I produced write songs, sit there. I saw how they did it. Right. And that inspired me to want to do the same thing. So I learned yeah. so much from producing other people. Was there a sense, did you have to battle a sense of imposter syndrome though? Because if you're thinking to yourself, I'm not as good as these people I'm working with, but you're also being paid to help them yeah. put their work on tape. Was that something that you had to deal with? Yeah. Something, I think it's something everybody deals with. I don't know anybody who doesn't have imposter syndrome. I mean, like anybody, even the biggest mm. people have it. Everyone should understand that. <laughs> if you remember anything from this interview today, remember <laughs> that everybody has imposter syndrome. And the thing that separates the, the people who do great stuff from the people who don't are the ones who learn how to put it aside. You, you can't let right. that enter into it. You just got to keep going and, mm. and do your best and, and not let that inner voice drag you down. But everybody has it. It's just some yeah. some people can do things in spite of it. Just the last couple of things, Don. Yeah. Um, one of the upcoming Blue Note releases is a tribute to Leonard Cohen, yeah. um, which fe features an incredible um, cast of, of singers such as uh, Peter Gabriel and Gregory Porter and Nora Jones and Sarah McLaughlin. Um, and I know that you had a relationship with Leonard. I think mm. he was on Elvis Elvis Rolls Royce Very on the good. Was Not Was yes, record. Yes, he was, yeah. What do you remember of recording that with him, working with him, but also your relationship post that moment? Well, we hung out a lot in the 90s, and he was the most fantastic person ever, man. You know, just funny. Like, I, I was afraid to meet him. We, we did a T, I met him doing a TV show. It wasn't that it was uh, Leonard Cohen, Sonny Rollins, and Ken Nordine were on the show hosted by David Sanborn and Jules Holland called Sunday Night. And the whole thing was programmed by a guy named Hal Wilner, who passed away a year or two ago, but who was just this behind-the-scenes force to be reckoned with, who would make unlikely forces collide and create incredible moments. So that was really one of the highlights ever, was being on, on that show and playing with those. You know, everybody would play together, too. But I didn't want to meet Leonard. I thought he was going to be all dark and depressing. And I, I just, oh, God. And he was funny and charming and great to hang out with. Girls loved him right up to the end. You know, if, if, if Leonard Cohn and Brad Pitt were sitting at a bar <laughs> together and a cute girl sat down next to them, she, Leonard would win every time. Because <laughs> he was the most charming guy, super smart and Nobody can touch those songs that he wrote. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've always had great affection for him. And uh, Larry Klein, who's a wonderful bass player, musician, record producer, was married to Joni Mitchell for a number of years. And he produced that Herbie Hancock album, The River, which was various artists singing Joni's songs. And it won, won the Grammy for Album of the Year. It was, very, it was about 20 years ago, I think, maybe. And uh, he called me up and he said... Uh, Let's do another one, but with Leonard Cohen's songs. 
get no nice. argument from me on that. And <laughs> and Larry, Larry knew him better and for a longer, was friends, you know, with him for a much longer period of time and and mm. and stayed up with him right, right up until he passed. So it was a, really a labor of love for him. And we put together an incredible band, you know, led by uh, Bill Frisell and Emmanuel Wilkins, who are two great Blue Note artists. Oh, man, I, I'm trying to remember everybody played. I think it's, uh, I don't want to say it wrong. Okay. <laughs> but it's he, okay. Put, put, put together an all-star <laughs> band, really. And, uh, yeah. and uh, James Taylor, Peter Gabriel, Nora Jones, Gregory Porter, Nathaniel Rateliff, uh, I'm forgetting folks, but a bunch of Sarah McLaughlin, they all sing Leonard Cohen songs, and it's just quite beautiful. Everyone steps yeah. out of their comfort zone a little bit and nice. uh, inhabits those songs, and it, it's a beautiful record. Yeah. What, what does that mean to you to be able to help continue Leonard's legacy via albums such as this? And, of course, he, it, that's happening it by itself with his own work yeah. living on. But, yeah. but for you to be able to do a record like this, what does that mean to you? Uh, it's it's gratifying. I'm I'm honored. I'm, it's an honor to be able to do it. I got a I got a nice note from his son Adam the other day. I, and Adam I've known since he was like a teenager, and I played bass on his records and stuff. And he just he said thank you for uh, continuing Elsie's legacy and and he, you know helping it to live on. And it got me all choked up thinking about it. It was beautiful. I'm glad glad yeah, to nice. do it. You know and. Nice. And it's good music, man. It's uh, it's really rewarding and gratifying to put good music out in the world for people, be a part of it. Nice. You know? Yeah. Don, very last thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Jackster is all about giving credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. Are there people, and I'm sure there's many people, but are there some people that you would give credit to for helping you get where you are today? And there's so many people who, people who really helped me in the beginning, you know, like this guy in Detroit who owned a recording studio named Jack Tan. And Jackie, he, he just gave me studio time without really demanding much. And he let me build some chops. He let me learn how to make records. And then when we outgrew his studio, he partnered us up with a better studio in Detroit, got a, a place called Sound Suite studios is a great old 70s room bob seeger cut in there aretha cut in there and uh they would give me the room after midnight jack tan john lewis michael grace i you know i, I certainly wouldn't be anywhere without david was his lyrics that that i'm right. certain of or for that matter for the great way that our singers sweet p atkinson and harry bones and donald ray mitchell the way they interpreted those things and really mm gave them an urgency and a real life. They really like injected them under people's skins. And I, I could go on all day, man, you know. Like I'm, the, sure. You know. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm <laughs> sure. Don, thank you so much for your time. It's been such a treat to talk with you. It's a real pleasure to speak with you. And you, I, I appreciate all the research you did, man. You, you, you're well, uh, well versed in some esoterica about my life. That, uh, I'm, and I'm glad. I'm glad you're familiar with that. That means a lot. And thank you, man. Good, good questions. Thank you, Don. And that's it for episode 100 of Humans of Music. A big thanks to Don for his time. And thank you for listening. This episode was mixed by Lachlan Mitchell from Parliament Studios in Annandale and the incidental music and theme song were written and performed by Sam Lockwood. Please remember to subscribe to the Humans of Music podcast so you never miss an episode or even better, share it amongst your friends and rate and review it. And remember, next time you need to know who wrote a song, who produced a song, who engineered it, who played on it, who sang on it, who did anything on it, head to jackster.com for all your official music credit information. Until the next episode of Humans of Music, I'm Rod Yates. Thanks for listening. <laughs>